Hey everyone, welcome back. So now we're ready to talk about the local behavior or short run behavior of a polynomial function. Once we've analyzed the local and end behavior of a specific polynomial function, we'll have all the information we need to sketch a graph of our function. And so what we saw for the end behavior or long run behavior of our polynomial functions was that that long run or end behavior was determined entirely by the leading term of our polynomial function. And we had to identify that leading term by looking at our polynomial function in its expanded form. When it comes to the local behavior of our polynomial function or our short run behavior, it's going to be determined by what we call the zeros of our polynomial or the roots of our polynomial and the multiplicities of each zero. So in order to help us easily find the zeros of our polynomial, as well as the multiplicity of the zeros, we'll talk about what that means in a minute, where it's going to be more helpful for us to work with our polynomial function in a factored form instead of a expanded form. All right, so here we have a quick example of a polynomial function that is expressed in our two different forms. The first form we see it in, uh, x cubed plus 2x squared plus x, is like our expanded form up here, right? We can see from our expanded form very quickly what that leading term of our polynomial is going to be, and therefore we can quickly determine the end behavior of our polynomial. And from the factored form, uh, we see that we can also write our function as x times the quantity x plus 1 squared. And so while we don't see the leading term very quickly from the factored form of our polynomial, the factored form of our polynomial helps us very quickly identify the zeros of our polynomial. All right, so if we want to find the zero of a polynomial, which is also referred to sometimes as the root of a polynomial, the x-intercept or the horizontal intercept of a polynomial, we just set the output of our polynomial or y equal to zero and solve. And this is why the factored form of our polynomial is very helpful here. The factored form of our polynomial is helpful here because we can use what we call the zero product property at this point, right? It's the only way two quantities or two or more quantities can multiply together to give you zero is if one or both of those quantities is actually equal to zero itself. So our first factor of x could be equal to zero, which tells us x equals zero is one of the zeros of our polynomial, or that second factor x plus 1 squared could be equal to 0, and that'll be equal to 0 when x plus 1 is equal to 0, or when x is equal to negative 1. So one thing we haven't touched on very much yet about the local behavior of our polynomials is the multiplicity of a polynomial. But with our last example over here, I think now it's a great time to define explicitly what we mean by the multiplicity of a 0. So here I've written up our definition of what the multiplicity of a zero of a polynomial is. And really it's just a, a way of counting how many times a zero shows up in the equation for our polynomial. So our definition is the total number of times a factor corresponding to a zero of a polynomial shows up in that polynomial's equation is what we call the multiplicity of that zero. So if we go back to our last example over here, x cubed plus 2x squared plus x, or in its factored form, x times the quantity x plus 1 squared, we saw that we had these two distinct zeros, one at x equals 0 and one at x equals negative 1. Our zero that occurs at x equals 0 is a zero of multiplicity 1. We identify that this is a multiplicity 1, 0 because it comes from that factor of x in our polynomial equation, and there's only a single factor of x that we see when our polynomial equation is written in that totally factored form. On the other hand, our second 0, the one at x equals negative 1, is going to be a 0 of multiplicity 2. We say that this is a 0 of multiplicity 2 because 
Well, the factor that corresponds to the zero is that factor of x plus one, and it shows up technically twice in our polynomial equation, twice because of that power of two. If we wanted to, we could actually instead write this as x plus one squared. We could write it as x plus one times x plus one to really see that second factor of x plus one, giving us our zero of multiplicity two at x equals negative one. And so earlier I claimed that the local behavior of a polynomial function is determined by the zeros and the multiplicity of those zeros. And now we're ready to put all that information together and start to visualize the picture of our polynomial function for our local or short run behavior. So earlier when we were talking about the end behavior of our polynomial functions, we saw that we could really break the end behavior down into four cases that we could remember or put into our notes. We have something similar that we can do for the local or short run behavior of our polynomial. And we can really break the local or short term behavior down into one of three cases. So remember the end behavior of our polynomial functions are telling us what happens as we move to the far left or to the far right on the graphs of our polynomial functions. But if you've graphed some crazy polynomials before, you know that there's lots of wiggly lines uh, in between the ends of our polynomial function. And that's what our local behavior and the zeros and the multiplicity of those zeros are helping us figure out. So to help us remember the four cases for the end behavior of our polynomial function, we referred back to our quadratic and cubic functions and their kind of end behaviors and the end behaviors of their vertical reflections. When it comes to describing the local behavior uh, near a zero, we just really need to remember one of three functions, either x, x squared, or x cubed. And so we want to refer back to x, x squared, and x cubed for the local behavior of our polynomial functions because as our polynomial functions, these larger ones, or really any polynomial function, passes through one of these zeros, it's really only going to pass through a zero in one of three ways, which is going to look like how y equals x passes through a zero, how y equals x squared passes through a zero, or how y equals x cubed passes through this zero. Unfortunately, uh, the analysis we need to really prove what I'm about to say uh, isn't going to be accessible to us until we get to calculus, so you're going to have to take my word for it. But I assure you that what I'm about to say is true. If we have a, a, a zero of multiplicity one, then we can think of that as like y equals x, right? How does y equals x pass through its zero? Well, y equals x is a straight line. It passes through its zero just like a straight line, right? And if it was y equals negative x, it'd just go down through that zero, but still in a very linear straight line type of way. Well, what happens to x squared at its zero? Well, if you think about the graph of x squared, our parabola, this is like the untransformed x squared, usually it has that zero at the vertex and then it bounces off that zero. It does not actually cross through and go from the first quadrant to the fourth quadrant or from above the x-axis to below the x-axis as it passes through at zero. y equals x squared bounces off of its zero. Right? If it was y equals negative x squared, we could just bounce off the zero, but from below. And what happens to y equals x cubed as it passes through its zero at x equals zero? Although we're just shifting things around here for the sake of this picture. Well, we know the graph of y equals x cubed as it passes through its zero looks something like this. It sort of flattens out just momentarily as it passes through its zero. But what we know about y equals x, y equals x squared, and y equals x cubed is these are all just very, very simple polynomial functions. If we think about the zeros at the zero for y equals x, it's a zero at x equals zero, although not graphed here at x equals zero, but it's a zero of multiplicity one. x squared has a zero of multiplicity two, and x cubed has a zero of multiplicity three. So what would happen if we kept looking at this pattern as our polynomials got larger? Like what would an x to the fourth look like, or an x to the fifth, or an x to the sixth? what we would see is that we're not really adding anything new to what we already have here. And so x to the fourth is a fourth degree multiplicity zero at x equals zero, and it still just bounces off like x squared does. If we graphed x to the fifth, we'd see that it looks a lot like x cubed. It'd be a degree five polynomial function with a zero at x equals zero of multiplicity five, but it would bounce off at zero the same way x cubed does. So really, these are the only three types of ways, besides maybe some vertical reflections being thrown in the mix, that we're ever going to cross through a zero. 
We're either going to cross through a zero in a linear straight line type of way, which occurs when we have a multiplicity one zero. We can bounce off our zero, which is going to occur when we have a zero of multiplicity two, four, six, eight, or any even multiplicity. And the third and final case for the short run or short term behavior or local behavior is we can have our polynomial function cross through our zero like our linear function does, but it bends and flattens out as it crosses through that zero. That is only going to occur when we have an odd multiplicity. And our odd multiplicity is greater than one. So if it's three, five, seven, nine, and so on, then we're going to cross through that zero like how our cubic function crosses through its zero or horizontal intercept. And now we have enough pieces of information to help us quickly sketch the graph of a polynomial function. We look at that leading term to help us quickly identify the end behavior of our polynomial function. And then we might have to put a bit of work in, but we have to find the zeros and the multiplicity of the zeros to help us then find the local or short run behavior of our polynomial function. Well, once we have the local and end behavior of our function, we can put it all together to sketch a graph.